afternoon, folks. Ted Rawson here in our downtown Honolulu studios, uh, Think Tech Studios, Think Tech Hawaii, uh, with our show, Where the Drone Leads. And uh, this show is known by the people that brings on as guests, and we keep going, increasing in our scale and scope of our guests uh, every time we have a show. And I, I would like to introduce uh, the guest we have today. He's in uh, Reston, Virginia right now, uh, well into the evening hours. And, and thanks, Brian Wynn, for coming on with us from afar. And there you are in Reston, Virginia, wearing your Aloha shirt. So we uh, totally appreciate that. Happy to be here, Ted. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brian is the president and chief executive officer of AUVSI. That's a term and a, and a name we've used many times on this show. That's the Association of Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. Not just local, that's international. This is the daddy rabbit of the uh, unmanned air systems and one, unmanned surface systems and unmanned underwater systems, uh, robotics in general, been going on for a long time. And uh, these guys are the ones who really uh, set the stage for us, set the path, and, uh, and drive the, the, the future uh, through advocacy with Congress and through uh, assistance and rulemaking. So, so anyway, Brian, uh, so much appreciate you coming on here after a very busy week. And uh, tell us a little, bit, a, a little bit about the week, Brian. Was, this is a fairly unique week, I think, in the White House. Well, it was, and, and uh, I, I, I can't think of a better a better week in, in, in memory. Uh, we've been working on a lot of different things, but uh, this week at the White House, with the, we co-hosted an event with the Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, uh, which featured a number of government agency uh, folks that had been flying unmanned aircraft systems uh, and a number of people that represent industries that are very eager to utilize this technology as well, uh, like the electricity industry. And, um, and, and basically, you know, I, I, as we prepare for the implementation of Part 107, uh, we, we had the, the platform of the White House basically to say, this is a great technology. We, we have a lot of value that we're going to create for industry and for society in general. And, uh, uh, and there's still a lot of work to be done. So um, we convened, uh, much like this medium, utilizing the internet. Uh, I think we got a lot of people interested. And then we, uh, we retired, as it were, to the museum, which is one of my favorite venues in Washington, D.C., uh, to uh, do a demonstration with a lot of young people uh, in attendance. Uh, and then we did some really hard work and breakout sessions to talk about what we can do to advance this a little bit faster. So, uh, so it was a really, really good week. I, I dare say one of the best weeks we've had in our community uh, from a policy perspective. And let me tell you what it looked like from the outside. Here we are 6,000 miles away in Hawaii, and, and uh, we had a representative from our, uh, our uh, unmanned air systems uh, test range complex out of Alaska present, but what we kept seeing, Brian, was releases about every six hours on various uh, media releases and such, and each one itself was really complete and, and really interesting in, in the subject matter it contained. The next one would top that, and the next one would top that. So, like about Thursday, we wondered, is this ever going to end? What's going on here? Because there was so much, uh, so much change, so much uh, innovation, so much creative thought, so much motivation to, to expand that just kept coming out of the media releases. And so uh, that's why it's great you're on here, because you were actually there, and uh, you saw what, what it was like from the inside, and you can tell us, but from the outside, it was just like, is this ever going to end? This is incredible. What's going on here? And what, what, uh, uh, what, if I can characterize this how I saw it from where we sit here, this whole year has been that way. The whole year of 2016 has seen more change and more advancing of the world of unmanned earth systems than we've ever seen. I just think a lot about uh, the big categories where things change. Public aircraft ops, all the efforts that uh, John Stevenson and uh, uh, Steve Pansy have been putting forth in order to generate COAs, certificates of authorization to allow uh, public service agencies, uh, uh, fire, health, and, and, and uh, police and such, to use UAVs. That got expanded incredibly in this year, with now with the blanket COAs. I saw the first one of, of those yesterday, and I was astounded at how blanket it is. Then we got the educational release that took place at your conference down in New Orleans, and that sort of becomes a low barrier of entry to the, in the educational system to generate concepts of operation and generate education in this domain. Now we have 107 came out about a month ago. It'll hit for real at the end of this month. The first time we've ever seen certification of UASs in a 
in a standard form, which is, I think, getting the attention of the world from what I understand in terms of uh, such a well done job. Then we have this White House conference that you probably had a lot to do with putting together uh, this week where business and uh, government and, and uh, research and the whole futures began uh, taking shape in a way that uh, could only occur at the White House. So what's going to happen next? <laughs> you know, in, in Washington, we like to say it's, it's not why, it's why now. And as you point out, there are a lot of things that are converging right now that are coming together. Uh, it's the result of a lot of really, really hard work. So in, in some respects, I, I think raising the visibility of this is, is extremely important. Um, giving a visibility to the, the good work that's been done, some of the folks that you've mentioned, uh, the, 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 the way this technology is going to be used. Uh, I mean, I'm very excited about any number of things that we could talk about. First and foremost, let's talk with the, about the educational pieces. I've, I've talked with Embry-Riddle University, I've talked with uh, Auburn University, I've talked with Atlantic Cape Community College, I've talked to Sinclair Community College. All of them are spinning up really exciting programs to start training operators and not a moment too soon because here you've got groups like the Sinclair Brad Broadcast Group uh, you, and, and CNN and so forth all wanting to step in, utilize this technology uh, as the regulations become available, the permission to fly is there. Uh, and of course, uh, our ability to provide very professional operators, uh, folks that, that understand the airspace, folks that understand the platforms that they're utilizing, know how to implement safety management systems. All of those things are going to be extremely important uh, to keep advancing the, 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 uh, the effort as fast as the technology is advancing. So there are many, many different pieces to this, uh, and I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen next week. All I know is um, we're, we, we've got a tremendous amount of work to do. We've got the momentum now, so we're going to take advantage of it. You know, that, that you just mentioned and implied something about the educational aspect that I hadn't thought of, and that's that uh, as the technology and the ability to manufacture and now certify these systems expands, we do have to have a trained workforce that understands that from a safety and an operational perspective and, is, and, and brings an aviator mindset into it. And the educational domain, be it high school, be it uh, community colleges, be it universities, be it uh, uh, professional training operations, all of those are the places where this can occur. And the educational interpretation where education is considered in the recreational domain, which then opens up that uh, the use of UAS is in, in training programs in a, in a great way and a low barrier of entry, as I like to say, I think is a, is a great way to get that, get that workforce and that interest going. I agree. And I, I, I personally, I am an airman. I've been a pilot for 25 years. I'm an aircraft owner, uh, fly uh, instruments in the airspace all the time. So um, I've been very gratified to see that uh, the FAA has uh, a, they've, they've, they've backed away from, hey, you've got to have, um, you know, what at one point we're, we were talking about, you've got to be an instrument rated pilot to be able to fly UAS. Uh, now we've got much more reasonable things, uh, you know, coming into play here. Uh, but as I went through the course that they put online for us Part 61 certificated pilots, I was also very pleased to see that they're pulling through exactly the same kinds of concepts uh, that, that, that are very second nature to me and all pilots, like pilot in command as a, as, a, as a very serious concept of responsibility and accountability. We're just moving, we're putting a remote in front of that. Now we've got remote pilot in command. Uh, but for those of us that are an airman, uh, and, and there's, a whole, there's a whole host of, of young people coming along, my son among them, who's a firefighter, who's been you know, at a very young age was chasing grandma and the cat with, you know, with, with an early stage drone. Uh, now these folks are, you know, they've got probably better stick and rudder skills than I do with a drone. Uh, and, 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 and yet they need to be taught the principles of airmanship if they're going to operate uh, aircraft in the airspace with other aircraft. Uh, so th there, this is really a critical moment in time for us not to get, as I like to say, uh, and as my brother said, who was also a pilot, uh, and said to me after my first landing in the aircraft, he said, don't get cocky, right? That was a good landing, but don't get cocky. 
I kind of feel that way at the end of this week. Uh, we got a lot going on, but there's a, a lot of work to be done so that we take advantage, we keep building this momentum, uh, and we execute the introduction of this technology into the marketplace as, 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 as brilliantly as I think it deserves. And you know, that leads to the, the thought that uh, goes through my mind a lot, and I'm sure others who are associated with the various FAA state uh, test ranges, and we have one here in Hawaii, we're part of the Alaska, Oregon, uh, Hawaii, uh, Pan Pacific uh, Unmanned Air Systems Test and Research Center, uh, or Test Resource Center, and uh, uh, because in addition to the grand expansion on the economic side that was discussed at the White House and all the different uh, parties, like the Department of Interior and such, who can use these systems, uh, later on, outside that, uh, that uh, conference, uh, the administrator of the FAA was uh, identified and quoted as saying that that's good that we can expand that, but we really need the data, we need the certification processes, we need the methods of, of measuring things, we need the means of control and standardization. We need all those things to go along with this economic expansion in order to have a circumstance and situation that's controllable and is going to get it right. And that, to me, takes us right to these six FAA-designated uh, state test ranges. So, let, uh, just from a selfish perspective, can you say what you might have taken away from the conference in terms of additional inspiration to uh, push those, uh, push that that work into those test sites? Yeah, we uh, we we kind of went behind closed doors, as it were, to to be able to use Chatham House rules, as we say. You know, not not we weren't attributing things to particular individuals, but we had government people in the room obviously industry people in the room as well as researchers and academicians in the room. Uh, and we broke out into different groups and we we're talking about things like what comes after part 107, you know, what about UTM, unmanned aircraft systems, traffic management. Uh, there was a whole, a, a whole range of different things and AUVSI uh, it, under the guise of our foundation, we're pulling those things together into a report uh, to, to, that will be public. Uh, but I, my takeaway from this is you know, Part 107 represents the least, the, the lowest risk kind of flying uh, that we can contemplate right now. And, and that's a great way to start. To the administrator's point, and, and we have a great relationship with the administrator, he's been, uh, he's been really very proactive in pulling industry in, uh, and, and we've developed a very, very good collaboration between industry and the regulator. Uh, you know, we do have to base the more complex operations that we want to evolve into on data. We need to make certain that, uh, that, that as we're executing this technology to do, whether it's flying at night, whether it's flying extended visual line of sight or beyond visual line of sight, uh, in urban areas, over people, et cetera, we need to be applying, you know, we need to be data driven, we need to be fact-based in the way we're doing this. The good news is that we're starting to fly under Part 107 very soon. We've got a vanguard of folks that are out there that have been flying under exemptions uh, that are Part 61 certificated pilots, so they're airmen. That vanguard is, are very sophisticated kind of folks. Uh, and we've got the six test sites, as you say, to, to start building uh, safety cases for the kinds of things that we're going to need to do uh, to optimize this opportunity as we go forward and truly make the, the technology mainstream. All of that's going to come together. All of that is uh, is extremely relevant, and you know, strategic patience comes into play here at some point. You know, we can't do it all at the same time. Now we need to we need to be a, a little bit more. Uh, we need to think about how are we allocating, and and I think there are some things that the test sites can do uh, very very effectively that probably can't be done in other places. And frankly, up until now, if it weren't for the test sites and places uh, where we've got uh, the ability to fly more complex operations like Hawaii, I, I think that a lot of that work would be going overseas. And that's, that's uh, a, a fantastic uh, testimony to why the test sites are, are useful and are going to be uh, effective in taking us in this data-driven direction. And, you know, in fact, we're even looking at these test ranges now as sort of a, not like a, not like a geospatial definition of a particular range, but pretty much uh, since we were use, operating under a, a blanket call up to anywhere class G airspace is, these test ranges become virtual. They can, they can take advantage of the uh, opportunity to operate in different areas uh, as the challenges are brought up. So they're not stuck just like Edwards Air Force Base or something like that to a certain uh, geospatial location. It does allow us to spread out and, uh, and take advantage of the, uh, 
the different threats and, and the environmental challenges and the topographical issues that are presented. In fact, here in Hawaii, for example, beyond line of sight uh, doesn't mean the same thing as beyond line of sight in Kansas, which might be six miles. Here, beyond line of sight could be 500 meters because you're over a cliff. And so uh, it's, a, it's a whole different perspective uh, as, as we see things here. So our challenge, I think, in the uh, test ranges is to take the, uh, the economic and uh, business interests that were evident in the White House uh, uh, workshop and associate those that can be addressed by testing and by extreme testing beyond the current limitations in the various uh, test range areas and then generate uh, ideas that can be addressed by the, the companies and the uh, foundations and such that uh, are promoting UAS operations and generate programs that then execute the data collection that the, is needed by the administrator to support what the White House workshop generated. Yeah, and I think you've got all the pieces that you need. I mean, let's take the utility sector. Um, I did some work with HECO in an earlier or earlier uh, part of my career. Uh, I know they're very forward-leaning in terms of technology in many instances. Um, you know, it, it, being able to, to utilize, uh, I'm, I'm imagining that you've got wind farms out there and, and things like that. So, you know, the, 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 there are ways that we can immediately apply this technology um, U utilizing those areas, but I think what, what the real game is going to be is trying to push the limits a little bit um, because let's face it, in aviation, you know, we're going to need some margin of error here. We're going to need to figure out where that error is and we're going to need to learn how to correct for it very quickly. And, and that is really the, the, the role of the safety agencies is the, in, in whether it's automated vehicles and, and NHTSA or the FAA with regard to UAS or the Coast Guard when it comes to maritime systems, their job is to try and figure out, okay, what are the, the good possibilities here that we want to try and, uh, we want to try and move toward. And, and then industry's job is to bring those technology solutions forward and demonstrate that. I think the big difference between aviation before and unmanned systems today uh, is that we're just not going to be able to specify in the regulations in a prescriptive way the way we did before. That's just not going to work and it would actually inhibit uh, the, the development and the advancement of the technology. What we really need to do is be performance based uh, and, and we're still going to be figuring out, we talked about that a lot this week, but we're still going to need to figure out exactly what that means. Part of that will be case by case basis. Under 107, we'll have the waiver process. Stand, you know, we, we're still figuring out exactly what that means, uh, but we'll know in in pretty short order here. Once the the regulations are implemented later this month, uh, we'll start testing that process. Um, but for things like, you know, how do you get from, you know, below uh, basically Class G airspace up to Class A airspace for some of the larger platforms? That's where uh, that's where I think we're. we're you know, we've got to have data, we've got to have ways of dealing with it, uh, and, um, and, and we need to, the test centers I think will help us to move from uh, accommodation in the airspace into true integration in the airspace, and then ultimately uh, we're evolving with the technologies so that even manned aircraft uh, are benefiting from the scale that, of the technologies that we're developing uh, in the unmanned area. You know, a couple of things you said uh, made me think. Uh, uh, the aspect of the performance-based operations and uh, certifications almost, it, 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 what, what I've seen, I've talked to a lot of guys in the FAA as, as the 107 was being evolved and such, and uh, what's interesting to me anyway, as I took it, was that the historical use of public aircraft ops in manned days, manned aviation days, uh, begat the, oper the, the use of UAS in that, in that uh, PAO domain. That was the, the trust that was developed on the manned aircraft led to the use of unmanned systems under public aircraft ops. The experience in the UAS with public aircraft ops was part of what informed the 333 exemption process to how to use uncertified aircraft in, in operations. The 333, as you mentioned, the, the you know 10,000 guys out there with exemptions, uh, actually in, uh, informed 107 to a certain extent. It's all that, that performance-based aspect and the trust that went with it. So the whole system behaved in a trustworthy fashion. And it, it was, uh, uh, there were some extremes perhaps, but by and large the system worked. 
And th I think that led to one of the things that we've seen in the 107 that uh, was a bit of a surprise. As you recall, I think when the NPRM came out for 107, there was, or maybe it was the, in the FAA's uh, roadmap a couple of years ago, there was going to be still the concept of a uh, 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 COA associated with a 107 or a certified operation. That's gone. It's been replaced by the performance of the pilot or the operator who now has the knowledge and the ability to operate in the airspace properly and therefore doesn't need a COA. That's, that's an incredible uh, uh, bridge of trust that's, been, that's occurred. And uh, so an interesting aspect is how do we continue building on that established bridge of trust? And that is another thing that I think these, the, the state test ranges can get into because you will have the human interaction They'll have the interaction with the existing airspace. And so the ability to test this idea as to whether the trust can continue to work in that integration is, is evaluatable, but really only in those test ranges. Yeah, and I, I, I completely agree. I think, I think that that process you know, has been really very, very constructive. I think the other element that's going to start coming into play here it is that the industries that are going to be utilizing this technology, uh, they're going to have their own safety concerns well beyond the way the FAA thinks about this. Uh, I, I'm going to stay with the utility industry for just a second. You know, what's the most important thing to the utility industry? Well, reliability comes to mind. Uh, they're not going to want this technology resulting in a grid getting knocked out because somebody runs into a transformer or into a high power line. Uh, so wh what are they going to require, et cetera, et cetera? Well, currently they can't answer that question. And, and that's where this collaboration comes into, in, into uh, play to great benefit because uh, the industry itself needs to be responsive to the needs of, of whatever the customer wants. And the customer's requirements in some instances are going to be well beyond uh, the safety requirements of the FAA. And that's not unusual in aviation. You know, if I think about my aircraft, I fly a single engine piston, high performance aircraft. Um, there are lots of pilots that theoretically, according to the FAA, are qualified to fly my aircraft, but not my insurance company. My insurance company would say, oh, I need, you know, 500 hours. I need, you know, 100 hours in retractable gear, uh, complex, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and at least 50 hours in type and maybe 20 hours with, uh, you know, or 10 hours dual time with an instructor. So, you know, these additional requirements come into play. And what I'm suggesting here is, is that the element that we haven't had up until now, and that I think will be really, really critical in moving forward, and particularly in moving beyond some bad experiences that we might have, because we have those in aviation from time to time. Uh, will be the support of those end user communities. They have an enormous economic incentive to help us help them. They clearly see the benefits of this technology, in some instances improving the safety of their operations um, by getting people out of harnesses 100 feet off the ground and things like that. So that's a phenomenon here that I think we're going to benefit from as well. And, and that's uh that is a really big subject, getting the user to stand tall and state in terms that the manufacturers can understand what the requirements are that are needed in order for this system to behave in an economic and a, and a good uh, life cycle cost uh, life benefit to the company. In fact, you mentioned HECO. Uh, we don't have anybody from HECO on. However, we have this little guy on the table here, one of our little friends, who's uh, making video show up on the screen here. I don't think people can people see that? What camera am I looking at here? Okay, you'd think I would know what this studio is all about, wouldn't you? But uh, anyway, uh, if you were up at HECO, you'd probably see something looking very much like this these days and, um, and bigger. But uh, we're, we're actually working collaboratively at the university with HECO on where this is all going. And uh, took a bunch of researchers up into the mountains where the HECO lines are and said, okay, what's it going to take to operate day in and day out up here. We got rain, we got wind, we got wind shear, we got uh, 40 knot winds, we've got uh, 1,600 feet per minute climb rate on the Koalaos, we've got turbulence, uh, and we've got to sit uh, 20 feet setback off the wires and automatically pursue down the wires with sensors that are picking up corrosion or other damage in the, in the conductors and such. Um, and we better, better, better be able to handle light rain, we better be able to handle saltwater intrusion, 
There's a number of things that we have to think about. Those are the requirements that we have to work on and, and bring forth and have then the manufacturers and the, through the universities uh, start coming up with solutions to those issues. So that's a fascinating part. But HECO is uh, certainly a leading force out here, and we really appreciate uh, the, the, the very senior and uh, uh, solid support they've got and the way they're very carefully proceeding down the path of, of making, uh, making good use out of these systems. But you know, um, uh, I saw a NOAA spec recently uh, for shipboard operations of unmanned systems. They wanted uh, five years of uh, a good life cycle operation on board ship. 40 knots is their wind speed as well, of course, Arctic conditions as well as tropical conditions. And they wanted like, something like two to three hours per day uh, operation for that five-year period. If I do the math, that's like 1,600 days or 1,700 days of continuous operation with nothing more than the daily maintenance that is prescribed uh, in the manual. That's what they wanted. They wanted a piece of gear just like a marlin hook, you know, something that you buy and it lasts for a long time. And, and perhaps that's where the change is. In fact, I, I suspect that that economic uh, 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 workshop you ran uh, would have a lot of that Themology coming out of it. That is what is really needed and what's important in a, in a, in a truly surviving economic business with these systems. And, and we can't answer all those questions yet. All of those things are emerging now, which is why having the freedom that you're describing under those COAs is extremely important. We need to be able to demonstrate not just to the FAA uh, that, that we've got a handle on the safety issues, but we need to be able to demonstrate the customers help the customers develop uh, those requirements with industry uh, that will actually accelerate uh, the adoption of the technology in some ways uh, almost just as fast uh, because uh, I, I think the safety requirements will be more stringent and we can meet the safety requirements once we know what they are uh, and and you know at the end of the day it's the customer that's going to matter uh, the customer is not going to allow us to do things that put their operations or their people at risk. Uh, so if we fo if we can na now we can get focusing on that, I, I think we're going to be good, and I think we're going to see some really uh, continue to have to see this momentum build. That's great. I mean, the momentum is just what this is all about. And uh, speaking of momentum, we have we've accelerated right through our our time period. We have a half hour show. In days gone by, we could have had forty five minutes, and we could have talked some more. But we'll have to uh, pick you up at a later time, Brian, and you can take that Aloha shirt and wear it on an airplane, get out here sometime, <laughs> and actually sit here at the table where Jim Williams has sat and Gretchen West has sat and a lot of other people have sat in the past. And, uh, but at this point, we thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom here from this uh, great week at, at the White House. And I think we'll be feeding off this one for a long time to come. Well, Ted, I, I, I hope to come out in December uh, when the foundation does a competition out in, uh, in Oahu. Uh, so hopefully I get a chance to sit there and, and uh, count myself among those very distinguished guests that you've had. Friday at 4 o'clock on the show. Outstanding. Oh, Brian Wynn, uh, CEO of AUVSI in Reston, Washington. Thanks very much. You can get back to the nightlife in D.C. now. And we'll right, get on right. with it out here. And folks, we'll see you next Friday.